So we're going to dive right into this uh, without further ado. I'd just like to jump right into the talk. So I want to ask some questions first just to kind of gauge the audience, figure out where everybody's at in their career. Uh, for starters, who feels that they have a clear career path? Raise your hand. All right. That's about 0.6%. <laughs> who has a branding strategy? I know the answer to this question. OK. One or two hands. OK, normally, that number is less than the number of people that raise their hand for the first question. Because if you don't have a clear career path, it's very difficult to have a branding strategy. Those two things are good, one and the same. They go together. And finally, and most importantly, and this is the mother of all questions, who knows what they want to be when they grow up? <laughs> all right, good. One hand. OK, uh, two hands. So uh, the good news is that you're all in good company. Uh, I've done this talk. Uh, as a keynote at the workshop around the country, I've spoken at this point to hundreds of project management professionals just like yourself. Nobody ever raises their hands for these questions, and it's not because they're shy. They don't. They honestly don't know the answer to this. This is a real serious problem in our industry. People don't have a clear idea of who they are or where they're going. And you'll see in the course of my talk that not only are all three of these questions interconnected, but they all get at the root of what I call the modern branding problem. But really, you could frame this talk a number of ways. You could call it the modern workforce disengagement problem. You could call it the modern self-actualization problem. You could say what you want. It covers a lot of different areas. I'm focusing on the branding part of it as a, point, as a point of entry, but you'll see that it goes in all directions. It's connected to almost everything in life. So that's why we call the talk Know Thyself, Brand Thyself. I do want to tell you a little bit about myself before we get started, only because it is relevant to the story that I, to the message today. My name is Michael Malutis. I work for a company called CAI. We are an IT staff augmentation firm and also manage IT services, privately held company up in Pennsylvania. We do about a billion dollars a year. Uh, just by the way, we're always looking for the best and brightest project manager, so please give me your card afterwards or network with me because you know we're looking to expand our, our reach you know, within, within this part of the country. Uh, for I've been there for about 20 years. So you can imagine after having been in the place for 20 years, I've personally worn a lot of hats. Okay, I've dealt with career reinvention. I've dealt with career branding over and over again. I've struggled with it, and I'm no stranger to it. So, as a result, you know, I've learned something about this, and I feel that I have something to give back to my fellow IT and project management colleagues. Uh, that's part of the reason why I'm here. But the other reason is that for about seven, the past seven or eight years, I've been part of the uh, marketing side of the business, uh, new business development, and specifically in something that we call thought leadership branding. And what that really means is that I focus almost all of my time on producing, generating, distributing education for project managers and IT professionals, most of which is free. Uh, now, we don't do this because it's part of our core business. We do this because it's a way to project leadership. It's a way of establishing ourselves as credible business partners. It establishes our bona fides as people who are knowledgeable about best practices within a wide variety of areas. And you'll see in your handouts that there's a blue catalog called the IT Great IT Professional. That's actually the library that I've spent the past seven or eight years building up. We have over 1,000 hours of on-demand lectures. It's all PDU approved. We're aligned with the PMBOK. Uh, you'll find tons of topics out there that are relevant to your own career development, a lot of hard skills and some soft skills. And if you send me an email, if you're in today's session and you send me an email saying that you want it, I will give you a free one-year membership, and that means that you'll have free, unlimited access to 1,000 PDUs over the next 12 months. When you watch something, <laughs> when, you, when you watch a lecture, the PDU will be emailed to you within 24 hours, okay? So it's all very convenient. Everything is aligned with the talent triangle. You can browse it. If you have any questions, you can ask me about it later. Now, you'll see when you look through that catalog that the vast majority of that content is what I would call sort of on the hard side of education and development. And my boss, who's the CEO, he came to me about two and a half years ago, and he said, you know, it's great what you're doing, it's working, but we've got to do more. As part of our thought leadership branding, we need to better represent what he said was the complete success of the average IT professional or project management professional. And what that means is that although you've done a great job promoting all this hard skills education, hard skills are important, there's so much more that goes into success that is missing in people's lives these days. People need to know how to brand themselves. They need to know how to develop career paths and career plans. 
They need to have aspirational goals related to certain roles that they want to get to so they can close those gaps. They have to understand how to network, what the importance of social capital is. They have to understand how to find mentors and what the importance of mentors is. There's a lot that goes into success. Certainly the hard skills are important, but I like to say that the hard skills are the sine qua non of success because you've got to have something that is immediately marketable okay, and of value and commoditized in some way in order to get the job and secure that job. But to advance in your career, there's a lot more. So he left me this challenge. You know, How am I going to do more with what I've currently got? I'm already working around the clock just to keep the library going. So I thought, well, I thought to myself, I'm supposed to be a marketing professional. I mean, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to know something about branding. I go to a lot of PMI events. I sponsor a lot of PMI conferences. Let me go out there and let me just put it out there when I'm at an event. And I'll say, you know what? If anybody needs help with their career development and branding challenges, just give me your card, let me know, and I'll follow up with you within a week or two and I'll give you a free half hour consultation, you know, and uh, pro bono, courtesy of Computer Aid, as part of our, you know, relationships to the community. So I did that for about 18 months, and I probably cycled through hundreds, literally hundreds, of free consultations with people just like yourself from all over the country, different parts of the country who were project managers, senior project managers in the middle of their careers. And one of the things that I thought was, oh, this is going to be good for me personally, because as a marketing professional, I'm putting myself in a situation where I am going to cycle through hundreds of different case studies and anecdotes and situations, and I'm going to have all of these different dimensions and perspectives for my future work. Many case studies, anecdotes, stories for my bag, my bag of tricks that I can draw from when I'm working with companies or businesses in the future. But what happened, well, that's not really what happened. What, what happened was that instead of looking at thousands of different case studies, I wound up looking at the same case study thousands of different times. So it wasn't exactly the experience that I thought it was going to have, but I did learn something different, and I learned something arguably more valuable, and what I learned is the genesis of today's presentation. So uh, what we're going to talk about today, first and foremost, I'm going to share with you what I learned uh, are the com most common problems with branding. Remember, that's our point of entry into this rather deep problem that we're going to discuss. Oh, I'm going I'm to share with you uh, what are the most common problems of branding among people just like yourself in the industry, but then we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about what is the issue? What is the surprising thing that I learned? Which is that what's holding people back is not technical, it's not tactical. Many of you think, oh, maybe you're gonna learn it today about Facebook or LinkedIn or how to use Twitter. No, that's the easy stuff. That, we can do that in five minutes. That's not what's holding people back. What's holding people back is primarily psychological. Okay, we're gonna talk about what that means. So I call that the inner journey, the know thyself. That's why this talk is called Know Thyself, Brand Thyself. We're gonna talk a little bit about tactics at the end, but we're gonna spend the bulk of our time talking about the inner aspect of success, which is a critical success factor. And then, if we do have time, um, if I don't ramble on too much, we'll bring it back to reality and I can share with you some tactics and actual techniques that are more related to things that you can implement immediately. So uh, my goal, first and foremost, is to inspire you. I want to uh, you know, get you really motivated to walk out of here and be invigorated with new life for your career. I also want to give you a, a framework within which you can look at your career over the next, have a framework and a path forward for the next two to three years. Uh, I know that how important that is, especially in light of the fact that nobody raised their quiet hands for that, for that first question. And then, of course, no presentation would be complete without leaving you with immediate takeaways that you can implement today or tomorrow, right away, uh, to improve your lives and, and in your career. So that's the plan. We're going to stick to it. I have about 50 minutes. All right, so let's go. So for starters, the problems. So one of the most common problems that sort of mystified me was I was amazed at how many people that I talked to have such a negative <laughs> connotation about the subject of branding or personal marketing or personal promotion or self-promotion. don't quite know where this comes from. I think it might have something to do with the maybe the advertising industry or perhaps the online dating business. I mean, you know, in, you know, advertisers are famous for manufacturing needs that don't really exist. And in dating, everybody famously misrepresents themselves. So, you know, on one hand, you have uh, manipulation, and on the other hand, you have misrepresentation. People think about politicians and companies that get into a lot of trouble. And there's a whole public relations industry that has come into being, which we're familiar with, that has the express mission or purpose of creating or manufacturing narratives in order to 
distract people from what's really going on or to reframe what's really going on. They're not there to tell us what the truth is. They're there to give us or to create appetizing, ingestible pseudo truths, okay, in order to you know present uh, protect the interests of their clients. Now we all know this. There's a famous expression that perception is reality. And while we all may accept the fact that this is the way the world works, most people tend to resist this, in my experience, in their personal lives. So people, by and large, are trying to live lives of integrity and wholeness. And so when they think about branding from a personal level or, or marketing from a personal level, one of the, their first reaction is, hey, wait a minute. I'm not a, I'm not a company. I'm not Disney. I'm not Coca-Cola. I'm not a toothpaste you know, product. I'm a human being. You know, that's a deep and complex thing. It's a lot more than just what I do. And I don't want to put myself through this process and turn myself into a commodity, create a false version of who I really am that is marketable, create a narrative that doesn't really correspond to my authentic self, uh, man, uh, you know, uh, man, you know uh, manipulate the, the public at large with a, a, a version or a story about who I really am that doesn't ring true. So these are a lot of, these are serious hangups that a lot of people have. Serious resistance points. And I would say that if any of this rings true for you, and if you have any of these ideas in your own mind, that you're probably right to resist this process. Nobody, very few people had a branding strategy, so I know that very few of you are actually doing this actively or, or, or proactively. So in order to uh, get past this first issue, <coughs> before we get too far into this presentation, I want to give you a couple of ways that you can reframe the subject of personal promotion and branding. So for, first of all, forget everything that you think that you know or that you think you know about what branding is and what promotion, personal promotion is. Forget it all. I'm going to break it down to a very simple formula. It's a simple thing. It's simply who knows you and it's what they know about you. That is it. Okay. Now the problem with this is that if you are not doing it, and I know you're not doing it, I asked you, and by the way, those were all trick questions, so I'm sorry, but <laughs> every one of those questions will come back and haunt you over the course of the next 15 minutes. Um, uh, I know you're not doing this, and the problem is that it's happening anyway. It is happening with or without you. We all work with people. We know people. We have colleagues and, 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 uh, and people who are subordinates and people who are superiors in the workplace. We have customers. We have part business partners. We've got suppliers, whatever it may be, the people that we work with and interact with on a regular basis as part of our adult lives and part of our, our jobs. And whether we like it or not, they're all developing ideas in their minds on their own passively about who we are and what we do and maybe what we're good at, maybe what we're not good at, maybe maybe what we're trying to, where we're going, what we want out of our careers, right? And, and very little of it, you can well imagine, is going to really correspond to the truth of things if we are not actively controlling that message. And how could it? I mean, it's just garbage in, garbage out. People have their own lazy reasons for developing their ideas about you that have nothing to do with who you really are. They have their own psychological uh, needs. They have their own biases. And everything is going through that filter if you're allowing it to happen passively. You're never going to be able to get what you want out of, out of your career unless you find a way to leverage the power of the, the marketplace. I like to call it the group mind, but it's, you get the idea. Now, that might sound a little bit mystical. I'm not going to talk about things like the laws of attraction or whatnot. I'm a big believer in that. There's a lot of books that have been written about it. Most people are familiar with the concept. But another way that you can reframe this that gets at the root of, of these laws of attraction is to think about branding as a combination of intentions plus goal setting plus a clear communication strategy. So for starters, the very first thing that you have to wipe the slate clean and start with is you must have very, very clear intentions about what it is that you want out of your career, what you're trying to achieve, and who you're trying to become. Okay, because life and work and branding is a journey of becoming. Okay, this is about what we're transforming ourselves into. It's part of the reason why I had the butterfly image on the, on the opening slide. You have to have very clear intentions. Most people do not have a clue about what they want in their lives or in their careers, and that's the biggest obstacle. You can't develop a career plan. You can't develop a branding strategy if you don't know what you want and what you want to achieve. So you must get clear on those intentions. And I'm going to talk a little bit in the course of the presentation about how you can do that. Okay, I'm not going to leave you hanging. Uh, when you make some progress with that, you want to try to find a way to translate these intentions into, into goals that are realistic and actionable and that are achievable within, say, a two to three year time frame. 
Okay, that's another rather challenging process. And if you can get that done, then you want to find uh, clever and strategic ways to communicate that to what I call the group mind, but what is in common parlance known as the marketplace. So that you can get all these people aligned with you. So that instead of them developing their own ideas, whether it's in your immediate sphere of influence or whether it's on the mass market in terms of the audience that we can have in social media these days, you want them to have a very clear idea about who you are and why you're valuable to them. And you want all that to be aligned with where you, what you're trying to become and achieve and, and where you want to go. Basically, branding is the clear communication strategy and it rides on top of intentions plus goal setting. Intentions is kind of the know thyself. Clear communication strategy is the brand thyself. Two parts of the same puzzle. And a lot of, and most of the time when people talk about branding, they unfortunately exclude the psychological component to it. I think that they're doing people a big disservice because you cannot be successful unless you address the inner side of this as well. Uh, but above all, the biggest uh, reframing and the final reframing is I want to give you an entire paradigm shift so that instead, if you have any of you have any hang-ups about promoting yourself. You know, and other, by the way, there's a lot of stuff that we get culturally from our own families. You know, I mean, I know, you know, growing up in, in, in my house, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to toot your own horn. You're not supposed to talk about yourself. You're supposed to sort of talk about we and us and the team. And by the way, that's also something that happens in the workplace. You learn very early on that if you want to be successful, you've got to think about the team and about the group, and you've got to use terms like we, okay? And it's very hard to break out of that. Well, what, you're a team player or are you a self-promoter? Okay, that's a complex that's gonna hold you back. So forget about all of this. I wanna give you a complete paradigm shift. Look at this process of promotion and branding more as a journey of self-discovery rather than a journey of like creating a false narrative about yourself or a second self or turning yourself into a commodity. I want you to look at, look at it as a part of a very healthy, psychologically healthy rite of passage that we all have to go through that helps us as adults become more authentic and more integrated on a deeper level. And if you can look at it as in that way, as a healthy and therapeutic process, you're not gonna have these hang-ups that there's something sleazy or that there's something manipulative about what you're doing. So those are big things that we wanna get past. Um, but back to some of the common problems. Uh, who's, um, by the way, who's seen this movie? That's it? Oh, what's it called? Oh, office space. Look, I go out and watch this movie and just, you don't need, this session can end right now because if you see this movie, you've seen this, everything in my talk is in this movie one way or another. <laughs> I don't need to give this talk if you've seen the movie. I used to call this the elevator pitch problem or the cocktail party problem, but I'm going to start calling it the office space problem because it was so space. iconic, or office space problem in the movie office space. I'm going to start calling it the office space problem because it was such an iconic scene in this film, which is, you know, what do you, what do you, what would you say you do around here? And the funny thing is that the people that work there can't answer this question, right? And the company doesn't even know. They have to hire consultants to figure out what everybody's doing, okay? Uh, so why is this a problem? This is a problem because now, by the way, and I apologize if this might sound a little bit technology-centric. Uh, there was a woman who said that she's a project manager, not an IT person. But I think that there is some general truth to what I'm going to say. But in my experience being in IT for 20 years, Okay, and, I, and how many of you, by the way, are, are in IT in one way or another? Yeah, so 80% of the Project Management Institute tends to be I, uh, IT, so I always feel comfortable with, this, with, with some of these slides. But I mean, I fell into my job, into my career. Okay, IT's always been great for me, okay, and it's been great for a lot of you. Growing in growth industry, uh, always lots of hiring. Um, uh, I got into the business in 1997, so I rode this wave. Anybody who's willing to change and learn and adapt, you know, learn new things and is good on their feet is going to do very well, okay, in this business. And that's what it's all about. It's all about survival and, and, you know, making a lifestyle for ourselves. But what happens is that because we fall into these careers and we don't really have any kind of clear plan, I mean, none of us were like 12-year-olds saying, I want to be like a, you know, a claims adjuster, a IT claims administrator for an insurance company, you know. I mean, it wasn't, these are not aspirational goals. And they're not clear, they're not clear tracks that, or rites of passage or milestones that you're going to hit in the course of a career like this, the way it would be if you were a doctor. You know, you, you, you get your you go to medical school and, you, and then you get your internship and then et cetera, et cetera. There aren't, these things don't exist, okay? There is no roadmap. So we fall into these careers and we go where the ball is going to go. And the ball leads us all across multiple functional areas. And over five years of 10 years of 15 years, in the course of being good, employees and good project managers, and we pick up all these little skills and these pockets and these area of expertise. 
And that's excellent because that's what makes you, that's why you're survivors and that's why you're valuable to your employers. But from a branding perspective, it can actually start to cause problems. Because after that much time, if somebody asks you a very simple question, like what is it that you do, which shouldn't be a difficult question, okay? Many people, most people that I talk to can't give me a simple, clear answer to that question, right? And one of the cardinal, you know, I know, and, and I, I'll give you some examples, but one of the cardinal rules about branding is that less is more. So whether you are in the elevator and you only have three or four seconds before the door opens, or you're at the cocktail party and you only really have 15 or 20 seconds before you bore somebody, right? Or whether it's the top of your business card and you only have like, you know, uh, three words that you can use. Or say the top of your LinkedIn profile where you don't have that many characters. You cannot tell your life story. You can't say, well, it's a little complicated. <laughs> I do a little bit of this, I do a little bit of this, a little bit of this. No, sorry, not interested, okay? You've got to have a way of consolidating across all these cross-functional areas, which in many ways have seen, might seem mutually exclusive. Like, I mean a lot of people that do, say, project manager, but they also might do business analysis. Or they, they are equally competent in both areas. Well, that might seem like, from a branding perspective, rather problematic, because you can't really lead with both, can you? I mean, in small companies, it's much worse. People do a lot of different things. I know in my case, I mean, how would I possibly so answer this question in a succinct way? I mean, if somebody asked me what I do, I'm like, I mean, I'm in marketing, I'm in new business development, I'm in sales, I'm in sales support, I'm in education, I'm in mobile app development, I'm in uh, event management, I'm in uh, uh, strategy, and I, mean, I, I go on and on. There is no title that is clearly recognizable by the marketplace in, in, in a commoditized soundbite that's going to represent value to the marketplace that does justice to who I am as a professional perspective. So people get hung up on this. Well, they shouldn't. Because there's a way that you can consolidate, you have to learn as part of this process how to find the essence, okay? And we'll get to this about what this means, which is it has to be tied with who you really are. Now, you don't have to lose and drop all of these other narratives about what makes you valuable and all these talks of expertise. There's a way from a branding, in terms of branding techniques, how you can consolidate some of this stuff, how you can subordinate it underneath a top line narrative. You have to learn how to do this, and a lot of this is actually inner work. Because when I sit down and I ask you what you do, and then I ask you, okay, well, you give me all these things that don't really roll up into a single soundbite. Tell me what it, who it is that you really are. Most people can't figure out what that is. And so that's what we have to start with first. But in any case, you want to be able to have a simple soundbite that you can go to market with. And then you can sort of, whether you're at the dinner party, you can have a lengthy or more um, discursive discussion or whether you're uh, in LinkedIn and you're in your summary, you can talk about all these other areas of expertise that you have, but that's not what you lead with. What you lead with has to be succinct, and that's often challenging for people that are in IT who have fallen into their careers like we have and are in the middle of their careers with 20 years of experience behind them. Now, there's another side to this problem. There's a corollary to this, which is that when we come into organizations, we're always given a title, right? And this is very seductive. Because, because this first problem is so challenging, it's very easy for us to think that we are solving the problem by grabbing onto the title that we're given and using that, okay, whether it, in order to describe ourselves to the marketplace. But don't, first of all, there's, there's a bunch of problems with that. First of all, your title is not your brand. Big problem, don't make that mistake. Your title is not your brand. First of all, your career belongs to you. If any, if you get anything out of this talk, you understand that you, your career is owned by you, and you must take ownership of that, and you must have a vision, develop a vision for where you, what you want to become and where you want to go. Your employer isn't going to do that for you, unfortunately. They give you these titles often for internal reasons that have they're not going to have anything to do with where you're going over five, ten, or fifteen years. It may have to do with who you report to, what your level of compensation is, what your position is within the internal hierarchy how they want to position you with the market, how they want to position you relative to the internal organization. Okay, and that's all well and good. You've got to abide by that, but that's not your brand. Your brand is something different that has to do with where you want to be in five or 10 years. Okay, and what is realistic and aspirational for you and where your current job is simply a stepping stone to get to that point. Okay, so that's an important distinction. The other thing is that, uh, the only other problem with titles is that, um, Besides the fact that they don't really reflect any of this inner work, okay, or inner knowledge that you're going to do or reflect your intentions in any way long term, is that your title tends to remain static for quite a long time. When you think about it, you're given a title and it might stay the same for like five years or four years. 
you're, every day that you go into work, you're being challenged, you're learning, you're growing, you're being pushed in new directions. You t how often does your title change? Okay, so work and life is so much more dynamic than what is going to be reflected in your title. You know, and something you're going to be, you're going to grow well past that title that you're being given in many different ways. And if you just use that as your brand, you're really selling yourself short on a, in a lot of dimensions. But I would say by far the biggest problem before we move into the inner journey of this, and this is the mother of all problems, as I said, and this is the, the uh, probably the biggest mystery that I've encountered as an, as I think as an adult, in, in, and I've stumbled into it accidentally in the course of of, of doing the consulting I do is that nobody anywhere, with, with very few exceptions, and there were two people that raised their hand in this room, which is actually quite a high percentage given the size of this room. Normally I'd be just talking to 400 people and one person might raise their hand, which is that nobody anywhere knows what they want to be when they, want it, when they grow up, which I think is rather strange and amusing, since, first of all, we're adults, we're grown up, so we would think that we would either be doing what we want to be when we grow up, or at least know what we want to be when we grow up, but we don't. So uh, this is, I want to tell you why I clued the slide for, it's a little bit of a tangent, but um, this is a school in Allentown, okay? So the company I work for, we're a privately held company. We have a lot of leeway with what we can do for the project, and we're big believers in education, not just within the IT community, which is a big part of our strategy to give away free education within IT, um, but we also look at this holistically and in terms of the entire ecosystem. So we're worried about what, you know, what are you, how are colleges preparing our, our future workforce. We support certain colleges, feeder programs, we invest in them, make sure that these kids are learning the right things. We also are looking at elementary school and high school education. Because in, I know in Allentown, for instance, where we're based, and by the way, this is no exception, this is true across any major inner city area, 37% of the ninth graders in the public school system will not graduate from high school. All right. That's a massive uh, problem. I mean, that is a uh, society-destroying problem. Not now, but maybe 10 years, 15 or 20 years from now. You cannot build a society. With numbers like that, you certainly aren't, we certainly aren't going to be able to maintain a knowledgeable workforce uh, with, with numbers like that. And that's not Allentown. That's every major metropolitan area in the country. So. What are we going to do about it? Well, you know, we can't solve this problem, you know, totally, but we can do something. So we actually built, as an experiment, four years ago we launched it. It's a private school, which is not a charter school. It's a private school, and it's entirely funded by us, and it's entirely free for inner city kids in Allentown. Okay, so we currently, we've been doing this now for four years. We've got K through four. Eventually it's going to be K through five or K through six, and then we're not sure what we're going to do. We might actually build, we lease the building right now from the Catholic Diocese, it's an old Catholic school that wasn't being used. We've got teachers, we've got iPads, technology, we've got everything. We got, uh, but eventually we might actually just build a middle school and, 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 uh, and just build a separate building. In any case, we've been doing it for four years. That's me, I actually volunteer there twice a week. I, I, right now I'm teaching, I'm running a chess club and I'm teaching first graders how to play chess. And by the way, huge success. If anybody has any questions about how to teach, little kids how to play chess, I am always available because it's not, it's, it's one of the easiest things that you can do. And it's the one of the most powerful uh, 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 things that you can do to help children develop, uh, which is to get, to get their brains on steroids. In any case, I, I do that a couple times a week. We have about 60, 70 kids in the school right now. That is last year's uh, graduating kindergarten class up in the top. And each year we have a little ceremony for the graduating kindergarten kids. And at the end of the ceremony, we'll ask them, uh, you know, what do you want to be when, when you grow up? And, uh, uh, you know, they hold up, a, they take a piece of paper or a sign board and they write it down and they hold it up and, you know, we take pictures of them with it. And I guess presumably we'll be humiliating them with this 25 years from now when, <laughs> when they become midlife IT project management professionals who, who say that they don't know what they want to be when they grow up. And we'll remind them that there was a time when they actually did know what they want to be when they grow up. So in any case, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure this out, but I, I am kind of just being facetious. I'm being, I'm sort of half, only half joking because I, I kind of know what's going on, and it's because it's called becoming an adult. And what becoming an adult means, among other things, is that we have to uh, make compromises. We have to adapt to uh, an imperfect world. We have to make do with inadequate resources across multiple dimensions, not just capital, but, but also social capital and financial capital. We have to um, uh, 
constantly be willing to adapt and to change and to evolve in ways that we not be, may not be clear where things are going. We have to be adaptable and to change and to follow these opportunities. We have to also be take care of people other than ourselves. We have people in our lives that are dependent on us. We can't put our own career fulfillment at the center of the universe if we have to make hard decisions and trade-offs about money because other people are dependent on us. And that's great. All of that is really great. I'm not, I mean, there's a, a famous saying by Charles Darwin, it's not the smartest or the strongest who survive, it's those who are the most adaptable and the most able to change. And the reason why you're all here today is because you have been adaptable and you have been able to change. And as a result, you're survivors within the world economy. You've got skills, you've got uh, a job, work history, you've been providing value to clients or to your employer, you've got contacts and, and credibility, and, and you, whether you know it or not, you do have a brand, okay? You just may not be in control of it. And uh, you've got incomes, my God, by, God, by golly, which is the most important thing of all, and financial stability. And this is fantastic, because this talk doesn't work unless you're survivors. But what happens is, at least what I've discovered is a problem in the course of the work I've done, is that a gap starts to open up between who people really are in the course of becoming an adult, which is, of course is a healthy process. This is all very necessary to become a mature human being. But a gap opens up between who we really are and what we do. In some cases, people don't even know who they are anymore, which is a different type of problem. And the reason why this is an issue for me or it's become an issue for the work that I do is because when I put myself out there to help people with their branding, you know, ostensibly thinking that we were just going to be talking about how to leverage Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and social media to project themselves out into the mass market, I would ask them some pretty basic questions. You know, like, what are you trying to achieve? What are your goals? Well, they wouldn't have answers to that. You can well imagine. Nope, very few people raise their hand in this room. The thing about that is that you cannot do branding in a vacuum. Okay? It has to be relative to some kind of objective. I could take each of you in this room. And I could brand each of you based on your past and your job history and your skills and the niches that you're in. I could brand each of you 50 different ways. Which way is correct? I don't know. You tell me. It depends on what you're trying to achieve, who you're trying to become, what you're trying to transform yourself into. It's relative to that. Branding is like the tip of a heat-seeking missile. But you have to know where that missile is supposed to be going. I can program it to help you hit a target. But you've got to know what the target is. Now, the target might change over time, but you've got to start with some kind of idea what the target is. So as you can imagine, most people don't really know what they want. They don't know what they're trying to achieve. They don't know what the, even the possibilities are for what they can transform themselves into from a career perspective. So I go a little bit deeper. Well, tell me a little bit about what you do and why you do it. Well, they don't have an answer to that. Why? Because most people fell into these careers. They didn't have a clear, clear career plan, you know, right? And they've just been basically adapting to the stimuli that their environment has been presenting to them over and over again, very short-term reactive thinking in order to sort of keep the paychecks going, which is important because you can't do this work unless you at least have a job and have income, okay? But they get so wrapped up in that 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 becomes an end in itself. They can't answer the question. So it's okay, forget about all this. I don't want to know anything about what you do. I don't want to know anything about how you got to where you are. I don't want to know anything about your history. Tell me who you are. They don't know. This is the problem. It's not that people don't know how to use Twitter, and they don't know how to use LinkedIn, and they don't know how to use social media, okay? It's that people don't know who they are, they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. As a result of that, they can't get clear ideas for what they want to become in two to three years because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing in the present moment. Most people are going through life in a reactive manner. Okay, they are reacting. They might, be, they might be responsible people. They might be great employees, very reliable. They might be able to get the job done. They may be worth every dime that they're getting paid by their, by their employer, but they're in constantly in reactive mode, simply reacting passively to the stimuli that are being presented to them every day. And they're never able, because they don't have a clear vision of what, what they want and what they want to become, they're never able to be proactive about saying, this is where I want to be in two to three years this is what I want to have, and this is what I want to transform themselves into. And they're stuck in this reactive malaise. And as a result, they go through life waiting for some kind of, I don't know, lightning bolt to hit them that's going to actually tell them what it is that they should be doing. But that lightning bolt never comes. And then one day they retire. And, you know, on one hand, you know, it's not that, that sad of a story because you've been able, in the course of this journey, to, to support yourself and to raise families and, and whatnot, to be financially responsible, and, and there's a lot that you get, but you're always going to be one of these people that said, well, this is who I was and this is what I did. 
And we want to avoid that problem. We want to avoid the nine to five problem. Part of the, process, the, the success criteria for this is to become more integrated, more self-actualized, more individuated, and we'll talk about that in, in, the, in the next few slides. Uh, so this is the challenge, which is helping people do, I like to say that branding is a holistic process, okay? And it involves the entire human being, encouraging people to sort of accept this challenge, as it were. But I don't want to leave you hanging, because I know that this can seem pretty daunting. So I want to give you a few tricks that you can use to, uh, to address the challenge. Um, for starters, before we get into this, there's a famous French philosopher, Pascal, who famously said that all the world's problems are related to uh, man's inability to sit quietly alone in a room by himself, which I always thought was funny because you know, it's funny because it's true. It's very pithy, and it's true. And I do believe that um, the fast track to making progress with this is simply to be willing to sit alone quietly in a room by yourself. And that just means that you're willing to let your mind disengage completely from the world that you've been adapting to for so many years. Okay, so we spend so much of our time engaged and adapting and, and, and dealing with the outside world as part of our survival strategy that we lose touch with something very important. So it's very, very necessary once in a while to just let yourself completely disengage. And when, when you do that, especially disengaging from notions about who you think you are and what the world has been saying that you are, Okay, it's, it's, it's a very deep, deep process. These answers will actually rise up from within. I do believe that we know the answers to these questions. It's just an issue of remembering them. And we have to allow ourselves to disengage from the noise of the outside world so that they can rise up from within. But, you know, that's the fast track. But if that's not your thing for whatever reason, um, there are more cognitive, there's some cognitive ways that you can approach this. And one of them, which is my favorite, and which is... Uh, deceptively simple, I say deceptive because nobody's ever given me an adequate answer to it, and it's also, by the way, was uh, a, a, a theme in that movie, Office Space, by the way, this is, is uh, yeah, I know, yes, well, I, there's, this was perfect, because, you know, this gets, you'll, you'll know why I put this, quite, this slide up uh, in just a second, which is that if you had a million dollars a year for the rest of your life, you know, what would you do, right, does anybody have any kind of, you raising your hand, man? <laughs> no. What do you think you do? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so all right, you get the prize. So everywhere I go, uh, there's a there's always the same thing. There's an awkward pause, and then someone will raise their hand and they'll say, I quit my job and I travel. And then everybody goes, Yes. They all like, they're like <laughs> sagely, they're all like, Amen. They're like, Yeah. And then they all jump on the bandwagon. But that just tells me that most of you need a vacation. <laughs> Because that's not an answer to this question at all, at all. And I'm pretty sure that after three weeks or three months or six months or nine months or however long it takes to get that out of your system, you're going to be right back where you started. Who am I? What's the meaning of my life? What is the work that I'm going to do in this world that's going to give me a purpose? What's my relationship to the world at large? What's my relationship to the community, to the cosmos? What is my life going to be about? You know, And it's going to be that much harder for you because you can't hide behind money anymore. Now, don't get me wrong. Money's really... Yes, sir? Have you also, have you also no time behind time? Like, once you retire, and you have all the time in the world, you have the money. Like, what point you will get out of that? Well, we, we'll get to that in a second, because that, I, I'm going to get to that at the end of this talk, because in a, in a, self -act, in a perfectly self-actualized state, you're in a kind of a... Uh, you're, you're, you're in a timeless, effortless space, where the work that you're doing is an end in itself. And you can just do it forever. And it has nothing to do with how much time you have or how much time you don't have. Okay, that's the goal. We don't want to bifurcate reality in terms of work and non-work. Okay? Work is everything to me. Okay? In one way or another. Okay? So you have to sort of find a way to sort of become so integrated that the work you're doing is actually part of your spiritual process in this world of becoming and blossoming and, 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 and becoming who you're meant to be. That's, those people don't need retirement, okay? And those people don't work against the clock. And those people don't work for a paycheck. They may get, they may make a lot of money, but the money is a is a is a servant. It's not a master, okay? So we'll get we'll get to that in in, in just a second. But I I'm, what I meant about hiding behind money is that because so because we are adults and because we have to be financially responsible, which is important. Like I look at ninety percent of my decisions through the lens of financial stability, I, you know. But because we have to do that all the time. Uh, it, it makes it very easy for us to kind of put aside all these deeper questions because we're chasing this this ball around and we're not really looking. We say, well, I don't. I have to worry about the mortgage. I don't have the time to sort of do this sort of inner work. And we, and, you know, you're making hard money decisions all the time. So it's 
it's actually very hard if you imagine yourself to have this infinite abundance. It actually really forces you to face these questions right away. We don't want to have to deal with this when we retire. We don't want to have to retire. You understand that? We don't want to have to wait 20 years to sort of figure this out and then not have any answer. And, and that's, a, that's a very bad problem to have. We want to do this process slowly and gradually as we are in the workforce. So uh, I like to tell people, you know, as a thought experiment, and by the way, this is not meant by any means to be a philosophy for a living because you will get hit by a bus, you know. <laughs> I, I, this is meant to be a thought experiment, okay? If you do this alone at home at night, okay, when nobody's, when nobody's around, which is actually convince yourself that you had a million dollars a year or $10 million a year or whatever it takes to just kind of break through. And I want you to almost hypnotize yourself into believing this. And when you get into that state, I mean, really of believing it, of, of that there is that infinite abundance in that state of trust and security in the universe or in, in, in the world, right? Look, then, then look at your career and look at where you are in your life and look at the work that you're doing day to day and honestly ask yourself, would I still be doing this? Or what would I be doing differently? Now, the people that are living more mindful, I would say, are living more mindful lives or have made a little bit more progress on this, they, will, they won't say they'll quit their jobs. And they don't say that they'll travel. They say, well, I would, I, no, no, they say, I wouldn't do that, but I would do a little more of this and a little more of this. And I would tell my boss, I don't ever want to do this again because I was never really good at it. You know, my boss does it to me all the time. He's always giving me graphic, graphic design challenges. I'm like, what are you thinking? That is not at all, I don't have those skills. <laughs> like, you're just torturing me. Like, you have a graphic design team. Like, it's not going to get done. It's, like, it's almost like a conspiracy to prevent the project from getting done if you give it to me. You know, if, if that's really what's going on here. And I would say, no, don't give me this anymore because I don't need this job. I don't need it. I'm, I'm infinitely abundant. So I'm, I'm going to work in this and this and this, and I'm going to grow the business in these ways. And people start in their mind, they start mapping. Okay, doing this type of mapping, that tells me a lot about somebody. Because if people, even in this thought experiment, get into the state where they're willing to do work in the absence of financial remuneration, because that's what's going on in this thought experiment, that tells me a lot that it's tied to who they really are. Now remember, that's the bottom of the pyramid. Now who they really are, we don't mean anything super mystical, okay? I mean something very practical. I mean, what I mean to say is that we all have these archetypes, okay? We're all born with a kind of a, in, in, in certain models, okay? There are things that we, we all have certain gifts, things, activities that, when we do them, we do them effortlessly, we do them better than other people, we get great joy and satisfaction out of them, we do, because of all of this, we do that we are highly productive, and we get so much pleasure out of it that the act of doing it is, and this is important, is almost an end in itself, okay? To such an extent that if you had a million dollars a year, you might actually pay somebody for the privilege of just doing this work, because it was the work that you're meant to do that you get the most gratification from. Okay, so that's a really powerful place to start in this process because you want to start to sort of, I'm not telling, by the way, don't get, don't, please don't misinterpret me. I'm not telling you to quit your jobs and divorce your spouses and, you know, go to India and find yourself. Not at all, okay? There are other people out there with that message and I'm not one of them, okay? I'm, I'm the other guy, all right? I'm telling you, I want you to ask yourself these questions or spend a little time alone with yourself and disengage. Get some indicators and clues, and then look at what you currently have and where you are. Life has gotten you to this point, okay? I don't want to, we don't, we don't want a radical disruption. I'm a very conservative person. I want you to then look out with new eyes, and you'll see that your environment is going to look differently when you have this inner knowledge, and you're going to have, you start to see that there are all these opportunities that are meaningful for you within your current environment to, to develop yourself that you might not have seen before because you didn't have the eyes to see them, okay? So that's why this is called know thyself, brand thyself. That's why I talk about this as an inner journey. I made, I'm gonna tell a quick anecdote. I think I do have the time, but I, it's a very important message that I, I wanna get across. I don't want anybody to make this mistake, but uh, the, eight, the assistant, the uh, VP of HR, where I work, uh, she'd been with us for 18 years, and she said that, oh, I heard you've been doing this talk, and it's been pretty popular. I'd like you to come in and do it for, for my staff. I said, sure, no problem. So I came in to do the talk, and this is before I had fine-tuned the message, and I, had, I was just being very cavalier and saying whatever popped in my head, you know. And uh, things haven't changed that much, actually, but uh, <laughs> it was much worse back then. And I made a very careless and cavalier remark about uh, following your bliss and quitting your job and, and starting a bakery or something like that. Uh, and two weeks later, she quit her job and she started the bakery. <laughs> and, uh, she had been with us for 18 years. Now, I'm sure that there were other reasons why that happened. 
I'm sure I was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it was a very important <coughs> lesson for me because it taught. I, I felt, you know what? I really want to make this point. I am not telling you to do that. Okay, I'm not telling you to quit your jobs. This whole concept of following your bliss is, which Joseph Campbell came up with, it's actually a very, con it's actually not as simple of a formula as you think. You know, uh, it's not meant to. People misinterpret that all the time. You know, work is hard, life is hard, it's filled with struggle. That's never going to go away. You can't just run away from it somehow. What I'm telling you is that, uh, what I'm saying is that you go inwards. I'm not telling you to go outwards. I'm telling you to go inwards, and then you will see that the outer world has everything that you need in it. And that you have all these blessings and opportunities. I mean, my God, if you've worked in a career and in an industry or even in a company for 15 or 20 years, that's an incredible asset that you have. That gives you an incredible amount of stability and credibility. And you can be a little bit more creative about massaging the opportunities in front of you to sort of get it to meet you in the middle. So I don't want, I'm not advocating that anybody go, go, go start a bakery. By the way, her, her bakery is great. And she sends us stuff every a couple of weeks, and the office is filled with these lemon sponge cakes and everything like that. And she's a master master brander. For her, it worked. Um, anyway, we have another. There's another uh, thought experiment I want to show you. So who knows what this is? Right. Okay. I'm actually surprised. Most people know what this is. This has been fairly institutionalized in corporate America. This is the Myers Briggs. It's one of these strength finder or personality tests. So uh, they usually give this to you when you enter the workforce, the corporate workforce, and it's meant to sort of determine what your archetype is. Remember I said that I, my, my experience or my belief is that we all have these archetypes that are, you know, if we can sort of map, if we can get ourselves into the right uh, sort of work, that these archetypes become activated as it were, and work is effortless for us, okay? Because we're born to do that sort of those sorts of activities. This is meant to kind of help you determine that or figure that out before you enter the workforce so that you don't have a problem 20 years later of saying, I need to quit my job, divorce my spouse, sell my house, and go to India, right? We don't want that to happen because that's a very expensive problem, not just for the individual, but also for society and, and for the employer. We want people to try to do this work as they enter the workforce in the beginning so that they can sort of continually fine tune themselves. Now, I, the, the, the premise of this, this is based on the work of Carl Jung, who was the Swiss uh, psych psychologist, psychoanalyst from the 20th century, and his hypothesis was that there are 16 basic archetypes psychologically. Now, the problem with an archetype, okay, is that we don't, we're not born with little tags stating what our archetype is. If only if it was so simple, okay. Unfortunately, it's unknown to us. It's dark. It's part of the unconscious. So we have to kind of learn this by making mistakes, by bouncing around and bumbling around in the world, by doing work that we hate. As it were, everything is a learning experience when it comes to knowing yourself. Now, I uh, one of the the power of this nowadays is that you can take one of these archetypes and you can plug it into a search engine, and it'll actually tell you, like, here are all the career paths or jobs or tasks, activities that are aligned with your archetype, and here are all the ones that are not. And just like the million dollar question, if you do this, you can start mapping this against where you currently are. And I think you'll be, I think you'll notice, you know, most people, now nobody's gonna have a problem of complete non-alignment. Most people would be like 50-50. They'll say like, oh, it says that I would be good at this, 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 and I do all of that in my job in some way or another, and those are the things that I like, and I've always been really good at. And then they'll say, here are all the things that you're not good, and you're like, oh, that doesn't surprise me either. So again, it gives you a way to, to start mapping. Now, I'll, the, how this worked for me, and why this changed my life, I mean, I took this test in college, it meant nothing to me. It gave me the same answer four years ago, and it changed my life. Same answer, by the way. So I mean, if you did take this test before, I would take it again, because the context will be different now that you've been in the workforce for 20 years. So I took this test, and it told me that I was an INFP. Now, an INFP is about 2% of the population. And it says that the, the perfect career path for me would be like teacher, guidance counselor, coach, uh, psychotherapist, counselor, uh, pastor, rabbi, witch doctor, shaman. <laughs> Uh, you get the idea, right? You start to see where that's going, right? So first of all, it's dealing with people. Got it. It's dealing with people. And secondly, it's helping them overcome whatever it is that they need to overcome in whatever context they're struggling with to become the best that they can be. And it's also dealing a lot with their inner life and also with the outer world as well. So it's sort of bridge up the shamanic aspect, which is that you're dealing with trying to get people's inner world aligned with, with the outer world. So when you think about that, you think, well, you know, so what am I doing in technology and marketing, right? And isn't that a problem? Because if I'm trying to, you, well, you're very wise people. You must know where I'm going. Because I'm, I'm thinking to myself when I'm trying to, I'm having a lot of challenges branding myself. And part of the reason is, 
it seems like a false narrative. It doesn't seem authentic. When I'm looking at my brand, and I'm trying to brand myself in terms of technology and marketing, something doesn't ring true. And there's a little pithy axiom that, I, that I've come up with uh, in the course of my work, which is this. Nobody wants a world-class branding strategy to keep doing the wrong thing with their life. That's what it is, because I can do this stuff for free, and I can't make progress with people. I can say, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this for you. No, I don't really want it. The reason why they don't want it is because they're not really sure. They're, they're, they know they'll get it. You know, if you, if you ask for it, you'll get it, and they, they know that. They just don't think it's the right thing. So if somebody came to me and says, I'm going to give you a world-class branding uh, 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 brand to become a world-class technology marketing executive, I would have said no, even though that was what my career path was. I would say I would have the same problem because it doesn't seem authentic because it's not who I really am. But that's only a surface problem because if you do some of this inner work and you go a little bit deeper, okay, if you – and I would encourage you to take this test – you start to say, well, wait a minute. I start, I start to ask myself questions. So wait a minute. Well, why have I not gone completely stir crazy for 20 years? And I've been good and successful at my job. But it's not an accident. Okay, you can't be enthusiastic. You can't be successful unless you're enthusiastic, and you can't be enthusiastic unless there's something going on there. And the more I thought about it, I thought, you know what? 80% of what I do from a technology marketing perspective is oriented around education. That was the strategy that we had, and. The, that was why I was passionate about what I did. It wasn't so much that it was technology, or even marketing for that matter. That was just uh, incidental, ancillary. What it was is that I was helping to develop people. I was helping people who had jobs keep their jobs by maintaining their skills. I was helping people who were competing against international competition because we were giving them all this tech education to keep them up to date with where the industry was going. It was helping people who didn't have the luxury of being able to afford college education to get into the workforce easily and quickly and at no cost because they could pick up skills and make themselves marketable. It was addressing a lot of things that I really cared about in terms of people and developing people. Do I care about technology? Honestly, no. I couldn't care less about technology. I can't barely even operate my computer. I was struggling before this talk okay, to try to get my, my floppy drive working. Uh, the, the flash drive. The flash drive. I, can't, I, am not a, I am not a technical person at all. Okay, I live at home. I, can't, I don't even have a TV or a DVD player. I wouldn't even know how to use a DVD player if I had it or set it up. So, you know, but that's not why I've been successful and why I've cared about my job. It's because it was, a, it was a vehicle for me to help other people. Now, when I brand myself and I tell my story, I can take all those things, but I, can, I have to know what to subordinate. Don't lead with those things that are ancillary. You want to lead with those things that are tied to who you really are. So when I look at that pyramid again, I say, this is the problem. Who am I really? I'm somebody who is like, I'm the shaman, okay? That's what I am, okay? Uh, that's my archetype. Why do I do what I do? It's an opportunity to develop other people and help other people to become the best that they can be. What are my goals and objectives? I want to keep doing that two to three years out. I want to have as many opportunities as possible to be successful and to earn income while developing other people. What's my branding strategy going to be? I'm going to lead in the marketplace with terms like human capital development. Okay, My strategy from a mass marketing perspective is that I am going to write articles or share content or speak in ways that's going to reinforce that with the marketplace. Because I want, when I program the tip of that missile, I want to attract the people, the resources, and the opportunities that I need to keep doing this and doing it successfully. Do I not talk about technology marketing? No, I do. But I have to know how to subordinate that. So when I think about leading with the market, whether it's on the business card or on my brand, on my LinkedIn or in the cocktail party or in the elevator, it's about developing people, coach, human capital development, whatever. There's a lot of terms that I could use. What is the context? The context is technology and marketing and mobile app development and whatever it may be. And that's very important. That makes me attractive within multiple niches okay, and within multiple markets. And it de demonstrates that I have context for the work that I do, and I can work in that area for the rest of my life. That's not the thing in itself. Okay? You have to, so this, is a, this becomes something that I can believe in deeply because it resonates with me on a really deep level. I can see that this is the path that I'm supposed to be on. Even if technology is not really the path I'm supposed to be on, it helps me stay on the path that I'm supposed to be on. That's a very subtle and important distinction. Okay, so this changed my life. And I would encourage all of you to go through some of the same exercises because I think it's an incredibly powerful exercise. Now, we don't have too much time, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, this was a Japanese model, but the point about this is that you know you want all of these – at this point in your career, you want to start expanding your definition of success 
to include not just what you do and what you can get paid for, but also you know what your personal mission is, you know, as a human being and what you want to become, you know, over time. You know, uh, assuming, like you said, you had a million dollars in income, and you want to start to incorporate this. Now, there was a gentleman at a conference in Chicago that raised his hand at this point, and he said, he said, I'm 52 years old, and I love your talk, but I feel like my career has passed me by. He said, I haven't lived my, I haven't lived my life like this in any way. What do I do? And I said, No. I said, Absolutely not. I said, You can't start this process until you're in your 40s or early 50s. How could you? This is not something that you can do when you're 18 years old or 21 years old. This requires wisdom. This requires time. This requires years of making mistakes, okay, and having real-world experience. This is a m path, a roadmap for the second half of your career, okay? That's what this is. This is a capstone project. Now you can choose not to accept this challenge, and that's fine. You have incomes, you've got jobs, you retire one day, and you know, God bless you, that's great. But if you want to get to a point of self-actualization, I'm sorry, we're not gonna, which is the Abraham Maslow's concept, you want to start doing this work before you retire. Because people who are self-actualized don't have to retire. You understand that? They're in a completely different mindset about who they are and why they do what they do. They might make a lot of money, but that's not the end in itself. So Maslow, that was Maslow's point, that when you get to a self-actualized state, there is no more gap between who you are and what you do. That's a meaningless concept. You are what you do. It's completely unified. Uh, hallmarks of this would be that the work that you're doing is an end in itself. Money might be is great, and it might follow you in, in, in massive amounts, but that's, that's just a tool. It's not a master. The other thing is that you do what you do because it gives your life meaning. It's a way for you to unfold who you really are in time and space. Uh, people who are in these states are often called authentic. They're also called, uh, they can get into flow states. So you read a lot about flow states. Flow states are where you lose track of time because you become so immersed in the work that you're doing. These people are not looking at the clock, right? Okay, they also uh, feel as if there's a higher sort of intelligence that's working through them because they're not getting in their own way. You know, they're not working out of their ego conscious. And they've kind of transcended that and they're tapped into something higher. So the people that can get into these states we're familiar with are like people like surfers, jazz musicians, computer programmers get into flow states all the time, a lot of the time. I never got into a flow state as a programmer because that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. Okay, I hated it. But I always get into flow states when I'm helping people. So that tells me something. Okay, if you can look at your career and the things that you do day to day and say, well, what are the things that I do that I lose track of myself in and that I do effortlessly, that tells you something about what you should be nurturing. People, don't make the mistake of building your career and your weaknesses. It's important that we work on our weaknesses, but don't build your career on your weaknesses. You have to figure out what your archetypes are, is and your strengths are and build your two to three year future goal on those strengths. Okay, too many people confuse this idea of, of working on your weaknesses as be, meaning that they're, they're building a career in that. Don't make the mistake. You want to build on your strengths and constantly be searching for opportunities to find out what they are. And that may mean that you put yourself or you seek out unique projects and unique opportunities in your environment so you can test yourself. Okay, one of the reasons why I volunteered at the school when I started was because I had never had any experience actually teaching kids before. And I wanted to see what would happen. And I loved it. I, I, I mean, I could, I could easily do that for the rest of my life if I wanted to. So that told me a lot about myself. I also worked on a nonprofit, come to non on nonprofit boards, and I hated it, okay, for a variety of other reasons. And that told me something about myself and the work that I should be doing. So put yourself in unique and new situations, and, that's, and you want to have as much knowledge as possible to fine tune this. Uh, I have, I'm out of time, but I, uh, why do you think I included this slide, final slide? Anybody have any idea? Inspirational, rational. Well, yes, but They're this. Flowing. These are examples of self-actualized people. Okay, I wanted to put a face on it because it sounds very abstract. Okay, the, really the goal, I said that this talks about a lot of things. It's about branding, it's about workforce engagement, it's about, it's about self-actualization, it's about all of it in some way. So when you think about Mother Teresa, do you think Mother Teresa spent any time worrying about her work-life balance? No. Yeah, that's kind of laughable, right? Do you think that she worried about her 401k plan? No. No, right? Do you think she worried about where she was gonna spend her two weeks vacation? No. no. Right. Did she work? Absolutely. All the time. Was she naive about money? Absolutely not. And I'm sure every, and everything she got her hands on, she plowed right back into the work she was doing. Why? Because money, for a self-actualized person, is a great servant and a terrible master. Her money was just a tool that allowed her to keep doing the work that she felt God put her on this earth to do that made her life meaningful. Okay, That's what self-actualization is. Now, somebody who self-actualized doesn't have a problem with branding. I guarantee you, 
uh, if I gave her an opportunity to, to market and brand her, she'd have no problem. She'd want somebody like that wants to stand up on the mountaintop and tell their story because they actually believe that the work they're doing is what they're supposed to be doing and they want to do more of it. Now, you don't have to be a saint to be self-actualized. I know a little bit about Steve Jobs. I don't think he was the nicest person, but I don't think anybody would doubt that he was a self-actualized man. Okay, this was somebody who was motivated by something much more than money. Okay, and he was he was trying to build something and a vision that that he devoted his whole life to, and he changed the world in the process. Some hallmarks about self-actualized people: they tend to be heroic figures historically. They stand out from the mass of humanity. They tend to achieve great things because you can't be enthusiastic, achieve anything without enthusiasm. You can't be enthusiastic unless you are self-actualized. And they tend to not be concerned about money. Elon Musk. These guys, Musk, Jobs, they could have gone bankrupt over and over again. They just would have found another way to keep doing what they're doing because it was an end in itself. Martin Luther King, I don't think anybody would doubt that what he was trying to achieve was deeply tied to who he was and what he felt his personal mission was in time and space in this life, and nothing was going to stop him. Okay, these are, and they, they, they're famous for a reason. Now, I meet people all the time who are self-actualized. I, bus drive, you can meet them driving the bus. I mean, they don't have to be famous, famous people. But these are our role, these are, you, these are our role models. Now, the problem is that you're not going to find a lot of self-actualized role models with IT. I hate to have to say that, but you know, it's not exactly filled with them. So be, you got to be willing to grab you to look for these role models in other areas, whether it's spirituality or engineering or politics. You can also get them from. The movies. I love Neo. <laughs> First of all, he's probably the only self-actualized person that we have from the world of IT. If you remember, Neo is actually <laughs> an IT professional. Okay, And if you also remember, the mission of that movie, his mission was to figure out who he was. That was the first part of this problem, at the bottom of the pyramid. Who am I really? He goes from being the 9 to 5 IT worker, which is like all of us, to try to figure out who am I really. But that wasn't the end of the journey. So don't confuse self-realization with self-actualization. He didn't become self-actualized until the end when he activated who he really was inside the matrix. Okay, what that means is that self-actualization is very distinctive from self, just self-knowledge. Self-actualization means that we are active in the world, that we bring who we really are into the work of the world. So work is an incredible opportunity for you to develop yourself, but it's also the end because we have to be in the world with other people struggling, life and death, and survival, because that's when self-actualized people, when they're in the world, are transforming the lives of other people around them, and they are transforming the world. One of those the hallmarks of those stuff, all those self-actualized people, they all have a transformative effect on the world. That's a very magical place to be. And that's if I and I would say I'm going to stop now because we're running out of time. But I would say that if any, if anything, I, I can't think of a better meaning and purpose for the second half of our lives than to try to integrate this. Into, into the work we do and, and into our lives. I think this makes our lives, you know, I'm saying it's easy. Probably the hardest work that there is in life, but I can't think of any better goal to have at this stage in our lives. There is uh, articles that you have, and uh, one of them is a summary of everything that we talked about. So if you want to read this article, this talk again, there's like a two-page article in the handouts. Uh, I also want to encourage you, send me an email if you want a free membership. Also, I want to let you know uh, if you want to... Um, Except network with me on LinkedIn. I'll also connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, here are some books that I would recommend. The Startup of You is a great book by the uh, owner of uh, the founder of LinkedIn, which teaches you about the importance of owning your own career and running your own career as if you were a startup and what that means. Uh, this Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life was written by a Jungian psychologist from Chicago. Great book about work and middle age and the challenges that we all face trying to trying to uh, find meaning and purpose in our lives through work in the second half of our lives. And Liz Ryan's Reinvention Roadmap is just chock filled with thought experiments that you can ask yourself at any point in time to start getting closer to this to this inner knowledge. Uh, here's my, again, my email address. Thank you for having me. I'll be around uh, for the rest of the day. And uh, it's been a pleasure to, to be here. Thanks. Great.